Welcome to the Texas A&M One Health Seminar Series. I am Tammy Krecek, and I'm the Interim Assistant Dean of One Health and have the honor of opening up the seminar this afternoon. I have to, I'm supposed to make a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, we're delighted to be co-branding with Veterinary Pathobiology and um, presenting the seminar together and welcoming our, our visitor. The second um, announcement is that there is a webinar running at the same time, and we're grateful to the One Health Commission for giving us the support to make the webinar available. Um, that also means that this is being uh, recorded, so if there's anything that you want later, you'll be able to go online and get that from the One Health website. So uh, just keep that in mind, and if you have any questions afterwards, let us know. Today's seminar is Beyond Ebola, One Health Strategies to Predict the Next Emerging Pandemic. Our speaker is an infectious disease scientist, and he trained in the UK with a bachelor's and honors in zoology and a PhD in infectious diseases. He has been instrumental in identifying the zoology, uh, sorry, the um, impact of emerging disease across the globe. His achievements, just some of them include, firstly, identifying the bat origin of SARS, identifying underlying dri drivers of Nipah and Hendra virus emergence, and producing the first ever global disease hotspots map. Currently, he's the president and Chief Scientist of EcoHealth Alliance. And he will tell you more about this organization and how, um, how much impact it is having across the globe. Our speaker has authored, authored over 300 scientific papers. When we met over the last 24 hours, I asked our speaker what's his passion. And his immediate answer was these emerging pathogens, of course. And I thought, well, that was interesting. Sometimes when you ask people that, they come up with something outside of that. But he also mentioned that he is also passionate about lizards and has been, has been uh, awarded the CSIRO Collaborative Research Award based on the work that he's done looking at fungus and its impact. Because someone asks you what your favorite stuff is, you, you can't say pathogens. It's pretty weird. But when you're talking with people like you, it's OK. And lizards is bad as well. Just a little tip for you as you go out into the big world. I've lost many friends for saying that. Where do we go with that? Yeah, just about that. I think that works. You can hear me OK. So I want, I've got a lot to get through. I want to talk about emerging pathogens. And I'm not going to talk about the amphibian disease that is an emerging disease and has already caused extinctions. I would like to tell you all about our organization in great detail, but that's a, bit, a little bit boring. Um, we're, we're doing the stuff that I'm going to talk about. We're a nonprofit based in New York. I've been, the direct, I've been the president for about six or seven years. I've been with the organization for 10 years. I've been in the US for 15 years. I was at University of Georgia for a while at CDC for uh, just a few months, years ago. Um, our organization does scientific research, just like any university department, but what we also do is then try and take the research and do something with it on the ground to build a program, to stop a disease, to educate people about um, why a disease is affecting them, why they're at risk, and try and stop them doing things that are risky, and to educate governments. And one of the amazing things is when you see the response to Ebola, for instance, the Lack of coordination and the criticism that's been leveled at a lot of um, governments and intergovernmental agencies. Really, there are a lot of things that need to be done that aren't being done yet. And I'm going to get to some of those today. So let's talk about a little bit about emerging disease. Why? Why I think they're a big issue. And first of all, I'll try and get this working. Okay. Do that. Okay. I won't do anything. Can someone help me? How? 
Let me, let me try again. Hang on. Yeah. Okay, no problem. I'm glad you're here. Be on the screen. Ah, that's, that was easy. All right. Thanks. Okay, that's working. So why is there such a, an obsession with emerging diseases? And I think, you know, one of the reasons is um, these diseases appear as if by magic in places that we can't predict very well. Um, and they seem to always catch us by surprise. They kill people, which obviously is a major issue. They often no. don't uh, actually affect that many people. If you look at SARS, for instance, SARS was a global issue. It was on the media. We had a case in New York. Everybody was very concerned about it. But it only affected a couple of thousand people. And that's nothing compared to the average influenza outbreak every year. But the impact is huge. The economic impact gives you an idea of why these diseases are such an, an issue. SARS cost between 30 and 50 billion global economy, single outbreak. Um, Ebola, we don't know yet what the cost is going to be, but it's estimated anything from three to thirty billion dollars. Um, even what look like relatively small outbreaks that, that start in very small places can spread and affect travel and trade and people just don't want to do what they normally do. And that It suddenly became something to be very scared about. It was already an issue before that, of course. Um, most outbreaks of Ebola, this is every known outbreak of Ebola virus, plotted on a map of Africa, which is where it all happened. Um, and the size of the outbreak reflects the number of people infected. So you can see the difference. Most outbreaks of Ebola don't really get to more than 100 people. They're often just a dozen people, a few dozen people. The ones that do get to more than 100 have never really taken off and spread internationally. This is the first time it's spread internationally, but in a big way, the first time it caused so many deaths. So it was a big issue. Now what we're trying to do, our organization, is to say, are there patterns to these emerging diseases that we can trace and use to predict them and do something about them across all emerging diseases? So I'm going to go through four examples of emerging diseases from Ebola through to some others, and just show you the work that's been going on. Now, um, first of all, where does the disease originate? Because it's okay to say it's spread globally, but if we can go back to the place it originated, find out why, maybe we can stop future ones. So Ebola has been happening for years. It's been repeatedly infecting people. It's also been repeatedly infecting non-human primates. And this is the One Health connection with Ebola. Um, it looks like it's got a wildlife reservoir. It looks like that reservoir is not primates because gorillas, for instance, die by the bucket load when they get infected. It's very, it has a very high mortality rate in, in non-human primates. That suggests they're not the natural reservoir. It's in fact caused declines and in fact, you know, ultimately may cause the extinction of some of those remnant populations of mountain gorillas perhaps if it gets into them. From all the work that's been done, um, there's, it's not definitive yet, but it's very likely that the Ebola reservoir is a bat. And these are the three species of bats in Africa that look like the most likely candidates as the Ebola reservoir. And they're, they're really important bats. They pollinate fruit trees, they pollinate crops, or other bats um, eat insects that, that, are, that are agricultural pests. So it's really unfortunate that bats are getting blamed for Ebola now, as well as rabies, and in general don't get a good rap. But today, I'm afraid I'm going to blame them for a bunch of other stuff as well, so we'll have to deal with that. Um, they're cute animals. We've, in fact, found Ebola virus all the way over into Bangladesh. There's reports now from China. Um, we know it's in the Philippines. It caused an outbreak in, 
in pigs in the Philippines, a different strain of Ebola. So this is a widespread virus that appears to be in bats and they're the natural host and then somehow it gets into people. And then regularly it, it, um, it causes outbreaks, but every now and again, and in this case last year, it caused a major outbreak. So let's look at that outbreak. This is another thing we try and do in our organization. Analyze what made an outbreak so big or what made it spread so we can try and predict them. Why was Ebola much bigger than any other outbreak? This is every Ebola outbreak of more than 100 people, of more than 100 patients, um, plotted on was it a really dense population? Did Ebola happen to spill over from bats to people in a very dense population? Is that why this outbreak was so large? I mean, it's so large, I couldn't fit it on the graph, so you know it's a big one. Well, actually, it's not um, statistically any different to the others in terms of the population density at the place where it originated. So that's not the answer. Um, another theory is that, well, we just took so long to respond that it got out of hand and, that, and it became un uncontrollable. So I looked at when the, the first response was to Ebola, the first cases reported and, de and definitively um, called Ebola, um, tested and diagnosed as Ebola, and were the number of initial cases much higher in this case than, than in others? And again, no, no statistical difference. There's nothing unusual about that outbreak. There was a very nice paper that came out that tracked connectivity. So that the other theory is this is the origin of the West African Ebola outbreak. And you can see it's right on the border of three countries, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. Um, it's a very porous border. People cross the border a lot. The, the border cuts across a couple of tribal groups that are actually contiguous to the same people. So they don't, they don't ignore the borders, but they regularly cross it. Um, it, it. It has a relatively dense population, but nothing unusual. So is the connectivity the reason? This is a map of connectivity, not measured by going out and asking people where they travel, but measured by mobile phone connectivity and road connectivity. And it turns out it is. It's a much more connected part of Africa than the usual places where Ebola emerges. So maybe that's the explanation. But whatever happened, it's, um, it's a major issue and we need to do something about it. So let's look at SARS, another major emerging disease, a pandemic, the first pandemic of the 21st century. So this is what happened in SARS. Um, World Health put an alert about an unusual atypical pneumonia in China and Vietnam. Um, it, eventually, um, a new coronavirus was discovered and shown to be the cause of this new disease and everybody realized what it was. But by then, it had caused global hype and, and uh, paranoia to the point where these cute little ball ballerinas in China had to wear masks to do their ballet. And I've got two daughters who do ballet. That would be tragic if they had to do ballet in masks. But not only that, of course, it caused death and it did spread and it did come to the US and we really dodged a bullet. Canada had far more cases than us um, and if you flew through the airports, and I did, um, Toronto at that time was absolutely empty. Singapore airport was absolutely empty. And Singapore started testing, you know, taking your uh, temperatures. You went through the video cameras at that time, and they've never stopped since. Um, so why did SARS emerge, and what's the reason that it spread? So this is some work from a colleague of mine, Hugh Field, who works for us now. He worked with the World Health Organization, showed that if you look at the first cluster of cases in Guangdong province in southern China and just look at who was infected, these are probably trying to get to the index case, the first case of the outbreak, tracing it back to ground zero. And the first group were from the food industry. So 39% of those first case cluster were from the food industry. So that looks like it's something associated with restaurants or the pre preparation of food which in southern China means this, and this is pretty, as you can see, unhygienic. There's not much biosecurity. This is a wildlife market. It's actually the, well, it's a wet market. It includes domestic animals and wildlife. This is actually a cat. I'm, I apologize to cat lovers. It's not nice, but people eat cats in, in China. You can see some chicken bits and just, you know, there's the occasional gut pile. This is the market where the first case of SARS originated, and we've been working there for almost 10 years, we've been testing wildlife in those markets, looking for pathogens like SARS to see if anything else is circulating. 
testing people like this guy to see if they if they are the index of a future emerging disease. Now, what happens in these restaurants, in these markets, is they supply restaurants with live animals, often from a wide diversity of wildlife mixed together in the market with um, with with other species. So there's a great opportunity if you're a virus, and this is why I find viruses so fascinating because you know they evolve very quickly. It's almost like they're out to get you. Well, they are, but they don't know it. But it's like there's some force directing them. You know that they they're trying to look for that little mistake we make that they can exploit and wipe us out. Um, and in this case, the mistake we make is by keeping all these different species together in the same place and then getting close up and personal with them. And when you go to the markets, they're not just like markets here where you go in and buy some, something and then leave. You know, and people work there and then go home every night. People actually live there. Um, the children are there in front of you playing right in front of the cages. The ground is slippery with um, feces and blood and gut piles and bits of animal. So it really is a perfect place for a virus to spread. And the initial idea was that these animals were the source of SARS. These are civets, mast palm civets, and they were sold in the market. And when they were tested, a lot of them came back positive, PCR positive for, for a SARS. Now, for those of you who know about that, that doesn't mean that they're the reservoir. If most of the animals are PCR positive, that would be unusual. You know, it's like if we're the Ebola reservoir, if we're all PCR positive, we're going to die. So it, it looked to us like these animals were recently infected. So we went back to those markets and started looking at what other animals in this initial outbreak investigation tested positive for antibodies. In other words, they were exposed anyway to SARS because a, res a reservoir should have antibodies. Most of the population should be exposed, or a good proportion. And we found that bats had antibodies to SARS. And this is a cute little kid looking at some bats in the market for sale. And yeah, they're an unusual item, but people do eat them across Asia. And in fact, we found SARS-like viruses. This is the um, SARS virus from civets. This is the SARS virus from people. And this is the bat SARS-like virus. So it, it, phylogenetically, it's almost identical to SARS. Um, and we thought, wow, great, we've found the reservoir of SARS. But of course, at the time, it was thought, it's gone, it's disappeared. It, even if bats are the reservoir of SARS, they're out there in the wild somewhere, maybe the virus has disappeared. Not only that, when you look at the sequence, the genetic sequence of that virus, it would have been really difficult for it to infect human cells. It didn't have the right cell surface proteins to link onto a human cell. It would have needed hundreds of mutations to get there. So although it was an interesting finding, it was still unclear what the story was. Now, this is a picture from Lao, um, and these are bats for sale. This is like a Monty Python sketch. Come and get your bats, only one dollar a pop. They're delicious on a stick. Um, I've not eaten them, I don't recommend it. They, you have to pick the fur off. But there must be something to it or people wouldn't do it. Bats are eaten across Asia. These are, it looks horrific. These, these are giant fruit bats, the bodies are about this big. And they clip, they, I hope they kill them first. They chop the wings off. They um, rapidly boil them to get the fur off, and then they put them on coals and, and sort of burn them on the outside. So inside, if you cut into one of these animals, blood comes out, and you can see some blood right there on the slide. So that's a, a risky, infectious group. But look at the protein on that. It's bigger than a chicken, and it's free because you just grab it. And not only that, they're a pest of your, fr your fruit crops. You feel like you're doing some good. The sad thing is they're endangered and even worse than that, they're critical for pollinating fruit crops and tropical forest all across Southeast Asia. So this is a terrible conservation issue too. Why did SARS emerge in China there and then? And really there's not an, an easy answer to this. And this is why I think the science behind emerging diseases is so hard. And it involves a true One Health approach with um, a wide range of disciplines coming together to understand it. Because part of it is human behavior, part of it is politics, part of it is travel and trade, part of it is the wildlife, the domestic animals, and the human medicine. Um, in this case, it's pretty clear, if you look at, this is up, up to round about the emergence of SARS, 15 year period, the global growth in GDP was about 2.5%. Um, 
the growth in China's GDP was well over 8% on average. So China's growing very rapidly. It was then. Um, people who traditionally eat wildlife, and there are a lot of them in southern China, are becoming more wealthy. And if you're a businessman and you're trying to impress someone and sign a deal, you take them out for a fancy slap-up meal and you feed them civet or you get them bats or you feed them some special animal that has great cultural meaning of 5,000 years of culture. So not only is that an interesting reason why um, SARS probably emerged, it's also difficult not to crack if you're trying to stop it. How do you change people's behavior that's based on 5,000 years of culture? By the way, the orange bar is how much air travel each country does. So look at that. That's quite interesting. Um, the, the world, in a crude way, values air travel twice as much as we can afford it. We're increasing it twice as much as the rate of our increase in GDP. And some countries, much more. So we're more and more connected every year. I'll come back to that later. Another, another disease emerged recently, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, MERS. It's caused by a coronavirus that, again, has a bat origin. I'll show you why we know that. Um, the first index case was in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, a six-year-old guy who uh, came in with um, no history of animal exposure, although he keeps camels. Um, and, he, and there are sheep nearby, and there are bats nearby, but he doesn't personally hang out with animals. Um, he, was, he started effectively, he was the first case in this huge epidemic curve that's still going on. I've not even continued this now. At the beginning of, of the year, it was increasing again, and it's now going to, there are still cases right now um, in, in Saudi Arabia and other countries. And there are probably many more that we don't know about. This disease spread, and that's why it became um, a big issue. It's, it's not really a pandemic like H1N1. It's not affected two-thirds of the global population, but it has spread even to the US, to Europe, and to other parts in, of North Africa. We went out to investigate the origins, again, to try and say, with this disease, can we trace back to the origin and say, where did it come from and why did it emerge? Now, we knew that the sequence, the genetic sequence, was close to the, the virus, was close to some bat coronaviruses, like, a bit like SARS. So we started with bats, and we went out to say, well, in a desert, where are the bats? Because um, a lot of people said there weren't any. We eventually found there's not only a lot of bats, there's a big diversity of the bat species in Saudi Arabia. And they tend to hang out in really weird places like this disused house. You know, these houses are built of mud bricks. And there are whole towns of these that have just been abandoned in the desert, perfect places for bats. And this is Kevin Oliver from our organization, stringing up a bat net. And this is his catch for the night. Um, he puts them in little um, bags, sometimes in pillowcases, if they're big ones, not because they're cute. And then he bleeds them, anesthetizes them, bleeds them, and then we test them in a good lab to see what viruses they've got. Now, how could a bat infect a person? So we looked at that as well. Where, where is the interface between bats and people in Saudi Arabia? And everybody said to us, oh, there's no way. We, don't, we never see bats. There's no way that a bat can contact a human. And then they said, oh, by the way, this is my, um, my uh, worker's house here. You'll see beautiful, nice bed. And then you look up, and there are bats in the ceiling right over the bed. So maybe they're not seeing the bats. Maybe they're not contacting them directly. But they're certainly, you know, bats hang upside down, so they tend to urinate and defecate from up there. And if you're underneath, you breathe it in or eat it. Um, so that might be an option. And camels, of course, they're outside in an outhouse. It's, it's a great way for a bat to infect a camel. We looked at a, a, a lot of bat species, lots of bats, and we found that this one, Tophosus, um, had a, um, a, the tomb bat, the Aplanane um, Egyptian tomb bat, uh, just to add a spooky dimension to it. Turned out it had almost identical sequence of coronavirus to the MERS virus from people. In fact, identical. Um, so it looks like there's a bat involvement in this disease, and somehow bats infected camels, and now they're infecting us. So we, st we started testing camels, and there was a lot of talk about camels at the time. We, we were the first organization to find the virus in camels in Saudi Arabia. People had found it elsewhere, but working in Saudi Arabia isn't, isn't easy, and we had a few connections to do that um, that was very hard. And as you can see, for the veterinarians in the room, always wear your PPE for photographs. Now, if you're in Saudi Arabia, it turns out, no problem, PPE is actually a bowler hat. 
or a trilby. I don't know what species of hat that is, but that's okay. Um, so, you know, um, of course, I'm just joking. Please don't follow those guidelines. So uh, how could, and we found lots of MERS in camels, and lots of groups have now done this. It looks like it's basically endemic in camels. How could it get from camels to people? We don't touch animals. We have nothing to do with them. So, you know, we put out a lot of messages to the media. People in Saudi Arabia, big message, people in Saudi Arabia should avoid being exposed to viruses from camels. And it created a backlash. And on YouTube, there are videos of, of Saudis who are proud of their camels and saying, camels are not filthy animals that have viruses. And they hug them and kiss them. And this is one of the cleaner pictures. There are some pictures with just bucket loads of saliva hanging out of these camels' mouths. So that's one possible way. Another possible way is slaughterhouses. Camels are kept for food. They, people drink the milk unpasteurized. They, um, they kill them and eat them. Uh, they keep them as pets. They race them. And there are the famous beauty camels that are made up with camels have beautiful eyelashes. And they make them up and make them even more attractive and take them around on beauty parades. Why did it, and again, the same question. So that's the origin. Why did it emerge there and then? So we looked at data on camel inputs and exports over time for the past few decades. And what we find is that there, is, there has been a spike in um, camel imports into Saudi Arabia, but it was already happening. Mainly imports, building up the population. So it built up the population to a certain level, and then they started exporting them. It became an export industry for Saudi Arabia. So maybe these diseases reach, or the, the population of animals reaches a certain threshold, the virus starts to really circulate, and then it can spread on. But, it, you know, this is an imprecise science, and the, the jury's still out. More importantly, where did it originate from in bats? Was it Saudi Arabia, or was it somewhere else? Because we now know that this is all over North Africa in camels. So we looked at this, and you know, in, the, in our organization, we have wildlife biologists, we have ecologists, we have people who know how to predict a species distribution. There's really good um, science for that. So we modeled the distribution of all the bats that are related to the one we found MERS in, and this is what it looks like. So even some bats in South America are related to those bats. So maybe they've got MERS or MERS-like viruses. But there are no camels there. There are llamas and other camelids, but no camels. So then we overlay the distribution of camels on top of that, and then we model the risk of MERS based on those two parameters. And what it looks like is the risk of bats spilling a virus over into camels, the origin of MERS, is probably not Saudi Arabia. It's probably the Horn of Africa. So we're now going to be working in Sudan and South Sudan, Egypt. We're not going to work in Somalia because it's too dangerous. But I expect we'll find more MERS viruses of bigger diversity, including the real origin of MERS, in one of these countries over the next few years. And I, I expect there are cases right now in people and camels of, a vi of this virus or a related virus that have never been diagnosed that could lead to the next pandemic. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to say, using the best science from a variety of dif disciplines, a One Health approach, can we predict where we should focus our efforts? We're not saying the next disease will appear in camels in 2017 in Saudi Arabia or South Africa. But we are saying this is a high risk. Let's put some energy into looking for new viruses there. So the last example of an emerging disease, um, I was going to say one of my favorites, but you can't say that. It's, it's an unpleasant thing, and it killed people. But it's a, it's a fascinating disease. Nipah virus, which emerged in uh, 99 in Malaysia originally, caused a disease, encephalitis, a brain infection, 40% uh, lethal in people. But it came from pigs this time, so it's a pig disease. It had never been seen before in pigs. And we know a lot about pigs. We should have seen this virus if it was there in the past. It had a big impact on the Malaysian pig industry, which was geared up to supply Singapore um, with all their pork that they use. So we went to Malaysia, we went back to the index farm, the place where the first human case was and the first pig case. And it's a 30,000 head pig farm in a beautiful part of Malaysia. This is tropical forest on these limestone casts. 
beautiful limestone cliffs with, you know, orchids and butterflies, and it's a gorgeous place. But unfortunately, there's a lethal virus nearby in a pig farm. The pig farm was really well ordered. I mean, by then it was closed down. So we started to look at this and say, what could have led to the emergence of this disease? We knew there was a related virus from bats called Hendrovirus in Australia. So we started looking at bats that lived nearby. And we actually found a camp of fruit bats here on one of these hills and started to test them. Sure enough, they had Nipah virus. And we found out that, that group of bats lived there for, for a really specific reason. When the farm was built, they planted mango trees and durian trees all around the farm as shade for the pigs. They also use the fruit, they sell them, or they throw them in the pig farm if they're a bit rotten. And of course, fruit bats love those fruits. Now, hands up in the room if you've eaten durian. Oh, yeah, that's a really good turnout. Hands up in the room if you like durian. That's correct. You shouldn't like. Yeah, it's disgusting, people. Really. I mean, I've tried many, many times. It really is rancid. It's a, a just like a jackfruit giant thing with spikes. They fall out of the trees. If you're under one, it could kill you. People die. From it. It's just got everything going against it. And it smells of, um, when you open it up, it looks like little, almost like fetuses, little yellow. It's just horrible. Slimy things, and, and you pull them out, and you... And the smell is like a mixture of gasoline, fish, onions, and fruit. And the taste is like that as well. I don't know how you guys even like it. So good on you. Um, but fruit bats love it. If you plant a durian tree, they're going to come. So that, what happened here was they brought the bats in right next to a pig farm. And some of the fruit trees hung over into the pig styes. This is after the farm's been closed down. So there are no pigs there now. But you can imagine the fruit bat comes in. Chews on the mangoes, spits them. Fruit bats are messy eaters. When you're eating upside down, it's not good. You're going to be spitting. And the pigs, of course, pigs will eat anything. And they'll snuff around and pick up the virus. In fact, we did an experiment. We, we, in the BSL-4 lab, the high security lab in Australia, we infected mango juice and lychee juice with, with Nipah virus to see if it extended the life of the virus, which it did. So fruit, unfortunately, is a great way for the virus to survive for a few hours. And pigs got infected, then people. Now, interestingly, when you look at um, pig and mango production, it is a perfect dual system. If, you've got, if you're a, a Chinese family in Malaysia, you've got one pig, you've got one mango tree, and a tiny pond with some carp in. So if you magnify that to 30,000 pig, you've got a massive lake full of carp and lots and lots of trees. Now, the production is clearly dual. Now, we used FAO data for this. You can see over the time... As pig production increased in Malaysia, mango production increased as well. This is the outbreak, the red line. Uh, when the outbreak happened, they killed off a third of the pigs, closed down a third of the farms, and the mango production dropped by a third. So it's exactly a dual system, and that's the problem. So we thought we'd solved NEPA for Malaysia. We, we advised the Malaysian government on this, and there's really simple rules now. You just plant your mango trees somewhere else, keep them separate from the pig farms. Um, but of course, we found out there were weird viruses in Bangladesh all the time this was going on. And we heard rumors that there might be Nipah virus. The Bangladeshi government was calling them, the, the, actually it was in India, I should say, uh, in West Bengal. The Indian government was calling them aberrant measles virus. Um, but eventually it came, became clear it was Nipah virus. And in Nipah, there aren't, in, in Bangladesh, there aren't many pigs. So it doesn't look like it's a pig back to pig to human chain. So we went out there. We've been working there now for uh, many years and trying to understand the dynamics. And in Bangladesh, it's a different thing. You've got these fruit bats that live very close to people. And people um, are utilizing every bit of the environment for food and for resources. So one thing they plant are date palms. And you eat the dates, but you also tap them and take the sap out, just like, um, <clears throat> like maple syrup. Um, but you don't boil it down, you, you drink it fresh. And this is a, a gachi who climbs up every night to the top of his date palm trees, puts a bowl in, there's a little tap that he taps into it, and overnight the sap drips into the pot, and then in the morning he goes up, collects it, and sells it. Apparently it's very tasty, but don't drink it, please, whatever you do. Because what likes fruit juice better than humans is fruit bats. So 
what we found is if you put infrared cameras in the tree, and there's a pot just down here, here's a bat licking at the sap. What do bats do? They drink. They've got a lot of fluid to get rid of because they're constantly in fruit juice. They urinate, and there it is. And they urinate right into the pot. And you, we find feces in there, we find urine, and we find the occasional dead bat. So when people are drinking the fresh juice, they're drinking a nepovirus broth. And nepovirus does well in fruit juice. So it's, it's, you know, after the fact, it's really obvious why these outbreaks happen. We've done a lot of work since. Is it seasonal? Can you time it? There's a seasonal spike in bats, uh, the virus in bat populations, and then the, se the Nipah virus, the, the, sorry, the um, date palm season begins. The two don't quite overlap, but just a little bit. If they overlap completely, we'd see a lot more cases. But it's really obvious after the fact. It's the same with every emerging disease. But what we're trying to do is to say, what are the rules? Can we stop them before they happen? So how, how do you do that? How do you stop an emerging disease? Well, first you need to predict it. You need to find a common thread that we can use to predict it. And this is a big challenge, even bigger because Fred Murphy, who's a famous virologist, says you can't do it, basically. And there are some real problems with it which I'll go into. Now, our first step on this was to say, well, can we, what, what is the geography of emerging disease? Surely there's some patterns to it that they originate, the place where they originate. Um, can we predict that? So this was a map in 2001 of randomly of emerging diseases. They seem to be scattered all over the world. There's a lot in the US. There's a lot in Africa. Uh, you know, what's the pattern? So we, we tried to do this in a more systematic way. We gathered every information on every single emerging disease event, the first case or the first cluster of cases of an emerging disease for the past 40 years, and we mapped them. And this is what the map looks like. And sure enough, the US is pretty hot, so is Europe. Where I'm from in England's right there, it's a horrible place. You can see it's full of emerging diseases. Where I live right now is just the same in New York. But there's a problem with this map, and the problem is, of course, it's completely biased. If countries like the UK and Europe and the US are richer, we're wealthier, and we can afford more surveillance, we're going to find more diseases. So we're going to bias the map. So to get around that, we plotted every single author from every paper in general infectious disease for a few decades and gridded them, got the coordinates, gridded them into a, into a database, and then used that when we tested the correlations for emerging diseases. And when you've got this amount of data, you can do some really simple things that are quite important. So one thing is, um, you know, if emerging diseases really are hyped up and the public are paranoid about them, and we're spending a lot of money trying to deal with them. Are we doing the right thing? Are they really on the rise? Is this a good use of our resources? So when you plot the data decade by decade, it certainly looks like they are. But of course, there's a bias to that because there are more and more scientists working on them. So that means more and more disease is discovered. When you do an analysis um, and, and correct for that bias, it's still statistically significant. So it's a very strong strongly significant rise in emerging diseases over the past 40 years. So that's great. That means we are spending our money in the right way. But here's the worrying thing. All of the known pandemics, every single pandemic that we know about, and most emerging diseases come from wildlife or have a wildlife part of their genetics in the virus, of their genome. Even flu has wildlife origin genes. And that, that group, this in yellow here on, on the graph, is increasing disproportionately. It's uh, significantly increasing over time at a higher rate than any others. And it represents the, the majority of the diseases that, that emerged in the 90s. And because you know the numbers, you can predict how many diseases we're going to see every year into the future. So we're going to see five new diseases a year, emerging diseases. Three of those are going to be zoonotic. So I'm in a One Health Institute, aren't I, I think? And you guys are all in one, working on One Health. This is great news. You know, this is a career stability um, for the rest of your careers. Th there will be more, and that's a very cynical way of saying it, a better way of saying it maybe. There is a real need for what you're doing. You know, people are dying of these diseases, and these are the, the predominant global health threat to the human population. They're the ones that cause pandemics, and we know that they have the capacity to cause very, very significant mortality to humans. 
And, and a good example of that is HIV. Um, from a single person chopping up a single chimpanzee, a virus got into that person and then spread to become a global pandemic that's killed or will kill 40 million people. Um, so that's very significant. Now, because we, we've globally gridded this, we've created for bias, and we've globally gridded that, we can then test some ideas out. And we tested, we looked for correlations between the presence of emerging diseases and things like rainfall, climate, human population density, wildlife diversity. And what showed up as significant was two things. One was human population density, where more people are on the planet doing things to the environment, you get more emerging diseases. The second was wildlife diversity. Where more wildlife are found, where there is a greater diversity of wildlife, you get more viruses that they carry and more opportunity for new viruses to spill over into people. So this led to a, um, a map, which is effectively a predictive map of where the next emerging disease will come from. And this was published in 2008. Notable diseases that emerged were H1N1 in, in Mexico, which is clearly on the map, and Ebola virus in West Africa. West Africa is one of the hottest of the hotspots. Now, our organization now works really only in these hotspots. We focus down, we follow the science, and we go to these hotspots, and we try and understand what's going on on the ground, and do more science on it, and then do some outreach to try and stop it working with local people. We're especially focused in Southeast Asia, South Asia, um, Africa, and Latin America. You, you can use these maps to say, you know, that, that's a sort of, the, what I just talked about is a sort of, let's do some good in the world agenda. What about what's in it for us? I mean, you know, people in the U.S. are concerned about their own health. What's the risk of a disease coming into the U.S.? Well, it's quite interesting. When you look at the global travel network, this is I forget the data, but it's from a nice paper in PNAS, and it's, I think it's a, a week's worth of travel, or it might be a year's worth of travel. Just visualize. You can see where the, bright, the brightness is. It's in the richer countries. We can afford to travel the most, so we do travel the most. Um, you, can, in, you can plot that travel pattern onto the emerging disease risk, and you can see where the big risk for us is. So the biggest risks of all, sorry, let me get back to that, are... Southeast Asia and South Asia, some parts of Af Africa are actually less risky because there's not much travel out of them. They're the places where we're going to get emerging diseases. You can even get it down to an airport, and um, we've got into trouble for showing this map. I, we produced a, a map of where Ebola would likely get into the U.S. from um, to try and show the, you know, the media that, that there is a risk to the U.S. This was very early on in the outbreak. We, we got no reporters talking to us, but we did get a certain airport um, PR person who said we should take down the website because it's bad for business or it's not real. Well, it is real. You know, these, it's a product of what we do. I travel a lot. I fly through airports. I'm part of the problem. We're all part of the problem. And the trick is to find solutions that allow us to do this but reduce the risk to health. It's very simple. And whether that's quarantine in airports, getting used to those cameras looking at you and taking your body temperature, I think that that's going to become standard in airports for the next, for the rest of the future, really. You can also use these predictive approaches to say, what's going to happen next? So we did this for Ebola. This is a map of Ebola coming out of Sierra Leone early in the outbreak. Is the U.S. at risk? Well, you can see we're one of the reddest countries. That means we'll be the first to get the virus. And in fact, every time we run these scenarios for any virus, the U.S. is top of the list. So this is a biosecurity issue. This is an issue for homeland security because viruses will gravitate once they're in the travel network to the country that travels the most. And that's, for better or for worse, is us. Um, but I want to finish with some ideas on, uh, well, I'll finish, I've got a bit more to go. But I want to talk about some ideas on um, how we can design a program to really get to the bottom of this. So remember the SARS virus. We, we um, went back out to China and we tested a wide range of animals to say, has SARS really disappeared or is it still out there? These, this is a nice bat that we called in Yunnan province. Remember this original map? So we have um, a little cluster of SARS-like viruses and SARS here. Well, this is what we've got now. By just a few more years of work, we've found dozens of new SARS-like viruses. 
and we've isolated them in the lab, we've got them in cell culture, and we've shown that the two we isolated actually now can bind to human cells. So even though the first one we found couldn't, if you keep looking, you will find the one that SARS originated from. And the same will happen for Ebola. We will find the reservoir, we'll, find, we'll trace back the story, and eventually understand why. So this means that SARS is a clear and present danger now to re-emerge in China. People are still eating bats. People are still doing the things that they did before. But not just China. When you look in other places, this is a, a, a global map of coronaviruses, including you know, a dozen or so new ones we found in Mexico. This one, Mexico coronavirus 9, is right next to MERS on, on the phylogenetic tree. So a MERS-like virus in Mexico. And you start to get into a problem now with the, the rate of increase in viral discovery programs and technology. We're finding so many new viruses, we don't know which ones are going to be pandemic or not. So there's a new science we've got to do, which is really Donald Rumsfeld put it the best. There are no knowns. There are things that we know we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say there are things that we know we now know we don't know. And there are unknown unknowns. There are things that we do not know we don't know. Now, I'm, I'm speaking here in the, oh, no, I'm not in the Bush Institute for Government Policy right now, but I was this morning. And I have great respect for Donald Rumsfeld. And he actually won a foot in the mouth award for this, which is a shame. He was talking about terrorism and rumors of a future event. So directly applicable to pandemics. There are some things that we'll just never predict. But there are known unknowns. There are things that we now know we didn't know previously. So there are things that happen, and there are relatives of those. And we can look for those related incidents and try and predict them. And that's what we did with viruses. So we, we decided we'd look out there and say, well, how many unknown viruses are there on the planet? And can we go out and discover the ones that are related to things like SARS and Nipah virus? And we used a technique that's been used by ecologists for years, which is when you want to find out how many tigers there are in a forest, you can't go out and count them all because they run away and hide or they kill you. Um, so the same thing happens with viruses. They could kill you as well. But there, it's really hard to find every one. So what you do is mark, it's called mark recapture. For the ecologists, you know that. You catch an animal, you mark it, you release it, and you count the number of recaptures, and you put all the stats together, you run an algorithm, and you predict the population, the total unknown population. We did exactly that for viruses. We captured 2,000 or so of these giant fruit bats in Bangladesh. We took samples, we anesthetized each one, we took a series of samples, we tested them for a wide variety of known viruses, and we discovered unknowns related to the knowns. And we, we plotted the discovery, and we plotted how often we rediscovered them. And eventually we saturate the discovery curve and could predict how many unknown viruses this bat has. Now we were expecting thousands, but it's only about 58. It's actually quite reasonable. Um, you can then extrapolate that to all mammals, and they're the big group that are risky for people. And you end up with something like 320,000 unknown viruses. Now, that sounds like a lot, but it's well within our grasp over the next few decades to discover all of them. And I'm sure some of you in the room will be part of that um, project to find every unknown virus on the planet. It's, it's, reason, it's a reasonable number. We know how much it will cost because we know how much it costs to do that experiment, that, that um, field work. And I gave a talk at the White House a, a couple of years ago, and I actually got this number. I got the guys in the office to run off how much would it cost. 6.8 billion. So I pulled it out of my pocket and said, 6.8 billion, that's all. And I saw the person from the White House write down the number, but I still didn't get the check. So <laughs> I'll let you know when it comes. Anyway, so how can we go out and do this? And there is a program that's doing this, and we're part of it. It's called PREDICT. It's run by the US Agency for International Development because they consider emerging disease a, a development issue. Um, if we build capacity in the countries that are hotspots where diseases originate, they'll catch the cases earlier, they'll catch the first few cases in people, and it won't spread. So that's, that directly benefits health in developing countries, and it directly benefits our risk of getting a, a, an infectious disease. And this is where we're working in PREDICT in a bunch of Asian countries, a bunch of African countries, including the MERS belt, um, 
the Ebola regions and other places where diseases like HIV originated. We're looking at certain pathways, things that we know cause emerging disease, land use change, farming, wildlife trade, and we're trying to track the patterns of that and to find new viruses. We're also interviewing people and saying, what do you do with wildlife? Um, to, to identify the people who are most at risk so we can try and eventually help them do it in a better way. And the idea is not to stop people doing things. It, it's a natural thing to eat animal protein. It's a natural thing to eat wildlife in a lot of countries. It's sustainable in some ways in some countries. Um, but the idea is for them to do it in a way that doesn't include the risk of an emerging pandemic. That's pretty common sense. Um, in the first five years of this program, we've trained over 2,500 people in labs, in government labs and um, private sector, sampled 56,000 animals, just non-human primates, bats and rodents. They're the most risky for new diseases. And we've found over 1,000 viruses, including discovering ones that we knew about already. And we've been involved in outbreak investigations for Ebola and others in, in Uganda and Nipah virus in Bangladesh and SARS. So it's a great project, but it really is a tiny um, drop in the ocean compared to what we should be doing. This should be a global effort to discover all the viruses and find out where the risk is the highest. Because when you do the economics on this, it will actually save money as well as lives in the long term. It's a, worth, a worthwhile investment right now. And again, I think this is great for people um, at your stage because you will be working on this. So I want to finish by just a couple of examples of ways that we're doing the outreach around this because this isn't just about the science. So let's go back to Ebola and one of the people working with us is Billy Karish who's famous for coining the phrase One World, One Health. He's worked in Ebola for years in pri primarily from the gorilla point of view, from the primate point of view. And he actually had a program that trained people in villages where they would see um, dead gorillas and dead chimpanzees and other primates in the forest and then take them home and eat them and get Ebola. He had a simple program going out to villages, training them not to do that. There's a risk of Ebola. Do not pick up dead animals and take them home. And it was very successful. And I think it cost $30,000 for one country. Now, ultimately, Bushmi hunters probably started this West African Ebola outbreak. So think of that. I mean, if you, if you um, extrapolate that investment across Africa, for that sort of program, it, even if it costs a few million, it's peanuts compared to the billions of dollars and the lives that Ebola has cost. So these are really good ideas, really simple programs. We're doing it in Bangladesh with um, uh, organizations that run um, ads on TV um, and around this idea of just put a simple basket that's cheap to make it a curtain or a skirt around the, pa the palm, uh, the, the date palm, sap collection pot, and that will stop the bats getting really simple. Um, and we're doing it in China with the wildlife trade. And I think this is, to my, my mind, the most exciting thing we're doing right now for the future, which is to take on the biggest consumer of wildlife on the planet. There are two of them. One is China. The biggest consumer of wildlife for food is China. And they drag in wildlife from across Southeast Asia. So we, if, you, if any of you read the book Spillover, there's a chapter called Dinner at the Rat Farm. This is the rat farm in that book. And these are the rats, the giant bamboo rats, and um, they're wild animals. But what this guy's doing, Mr. Wei, who's a good friend of mine, I'm now godfather to his daughter, um, he's breeding these rats in captivity instead of catching them in the wild. There are less viruses. It's better for conservation. It's better for health. So we're trying to turn this into a program supported by the Chinese government and supported by non-profits around the world. Now, the other biggest consumer of wildlife is us. We're the biggest consumer of wildlife on the planet for, for pets. We bring in, and it took us a couple of years to get this data, we published it in science, um, it's over 100 million animals in a, in a six year period. It's very difficult to explain. It's the equivalent of each New Yorker owning 182 pets, and some of them do, by the way. Um, it's, the, it's three pets per U.S. household, which seems impossible. But of course, these little pets come in, and then they die, and then they go and get another one. Um, and 
you know, we, we went through the animals that come into pet stores in the US and the potential diseases that they could carry. And it includes Ebola. And of course, there is Ebola resin from primates. It includes diseases that did happen, like monkeypox. And this is that little girl in Wisconsin that proudly showed off a monkeypox lesion. This is an African virus from rodents in, in the West African jungle in Wisconsin. Um, so the pet trade is, is a good way for viruses to spread. We're actually working with the pet industry to try and do something about it. We've got ads in the airports that talk about the illegal trade. We've got a program called Eco Healthy Pets, which includes some of the big pet industry um, companies to say, when you go and choose a pet for your child or for yourself, use our app and choose one that's not coming from the wild, that doesn't bring the risk of diseases, that's good for conservation. So I want to finish then, thank you and everybody else we work with and all our funders, and just say, um, you're doing a great thing by focusing your careers on One Health, because it is the way of the future. And there is real traction as people are beginning to see all of these pandemics have that thing in common, the linkage between environment, humans, wildlife, and livestock. So keep up the great work. Pleasure to meet you all. There's a, there's a couple of minutes for questions, um, if, if you folks have, if there's questions. And then, Peter, please repeat the question for the webinar folks. Will do. Any questions? Comments? Thank you for a great presentation. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about it. And also the question is, is you people are working on multi-million dollar programs to understand that. So one idea is that bats are special. They've got um, a special immune system because they fly or because they live in dense colonies. Um, and that we need to find out more about their immune system than maybe ways we can use that to fight some of these diseases. And the other school thought is that they're not that special because actually, you know, there are so many of them out there. There are as many bat species as there are rodents. But we just don't know much about them. We've never really gone out there and looked for viruses in them like we have done in rodents. We've not lived with them closely for millions of years like we have done with rodents. So we've not picked up their viruses yet. And as we encroach further into the environment, the viruses get to us. But I think there's going to be some really interesting science over the next few years on that. And it is a great question. It's kind of unfortunate because bats get a bad rap. And it turns out there's a reason. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but I've got to say, bats are critical for the environment and should be conserved, not wiped out. So I'll repeat the question is, is um, people said that the, the current Ebola outbreak, the West African Ebola, Ebola virus is close to the Zaire strain. How did it get to West Africa from Zaire? Well, or was it already there? And I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think it was already there. You know, um, if you go back to the Thai forest outbreak in chimpanzees in, a, um, in West Africa, I forget which country, back in the, it was in the last millennium. So it was 80s or 70s, I can't remember. Um, that it was the same strain. So it was already there. It was just in wildlife and it had not been seen in people. Now, if bats are the reservoir, which it looks like they are, when you look at Marburg virus, it's not a common virus. You know, maybe one in 500 or 1,000 bats has the virus at any one time. So you really do have to make contact with that one bat to get infected. It's a rare virus in, 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 the, in the reservoir. So in that sense, it could have been out there for millennia and then and probably was, but now somehow that one opportunity happened with more and more people doing more and more things, and then it spread. That's, that's my view of it anyway. Uh, you mentioned that uh, much of your work and your research is done in parts of Asia and Africa, but also that Latin America could potentially be a yeah. uh, future hotspot for other pets. Does your, do any of your organizations uh, plan on moving any possible uh, operations there? 
Yeah, we're working in Brazil right now. We've worked in Mexico, and we've worked all over Latin America. It's just given the resources, where do you where do you put most of your energy right now? Asia and Africa seem to be the hottest those hotspots. But there, there will be diseases from Latin America that will happen that are that are going to be high risk, and we're currently doing work in the Amazon and in coastal forest in Brazil to look at exactly this to viral discovery, look at how humans interact with people with the wildlife. I hope more and more happens. There was a great um, program um, many decades ago from Rockefeller that went into the Amazon and all over Latin America and collected mosquitoes and, and looked for new arboviruses and found a lot. And a lot of those never got characterized. Um, they've not really emerged yet, but they're still out there. So, yeah. Yeah, well, well, we did. We we did. It's published in the ID. You should read it. But we did a really good job of, of validating. We used the gold standard at CSIRO, who are a great lab. We actually flew them out to Bangladesh to do that work. The Chinese study is also cross-validated with, in the proper way, a serum neutralization. But it, you know, it it may not be the um, the Ebola viruses from Africa that are found in those animals. It it could well be. Ebola restin or a relative of Ebola restin. So um, there are going to be other Ebola viruses in, in Asia. Um, you know, it, you look at Ebola restin, you think it's not a risk for human infection, but it got into pigs unexpectedly. These things can be lethal, and, and I think we need to do more. What's amazing to me is that it's just a few academics doing these studies that find the viruses. There should be a global program to go out there and systematically discover the relatives of every the relatives of um, Ebola virus for every type of bat that's out there on that potential zone. Now, there was even one, there was a filler virus discovered in Spain recently too from bats. So there will be a wider diversity. It's just no one's gone out there and done it yet. It's a great project. Well, I would like to just, um, just say that this has been um, filmed or recorded so you can go on to the One Health site, Texas A&M One Health site, to get that recording. It should be up all goes as planned later today. So, and please help me uh, in thanking Dr. Dazak for taking time to join us today. Thanks very much.